Solid principles are a set of five design principles that help guide object-oriented software development. In fact, in multiple tech interviews, I was asked to explain the solid principles and provide examples of their application in real-world scenarios. This highlighted how crucial solid principles are in the software development industry. But understanding solid principles isn't just about passing coding interviews. It's about becoming a better software developer. In this video, we'll delve into the solid principles, a set of five design principles that serves as guidelines for writing clean, maintainable, and scalable object-oriented code. We'll explore each principle in detail, illustrating its concepts with practical and simple Java examples. By the end of this video, you will have a solid understanding of all the five principles. So let's get started. Just like architects consider factors like structural integrity, material properties, and environment impact while designing buildings, software architects and developers consider solid principles to ensure their code is well designed and can withstand the test of time. They are like the architectural blueprints of software design, ensuring your code base isn't a house of cards, but a robust and scalable skyscraper. Robert C. Martin played a significant role in promoting and refining solid principles. He wrote extensively about them in his books and articles, advocating for their adoption in object-oriented programming. Single Responsibility Principle, or SRP. Basically, the idea is a class should have only one reason to change. In other words, each class should be responsible for a single part of the software functionality. In this original employee class, there are multiple responsibilities. It stores the employee information such as name, salary, etc. It contains the logic to determine the employee's paycheck. It handles saving the employee data into the database, and it also generates a report based on employee data. The issue here is that this class has too many reasons to change. Let's say the business logic for calculating the pay changes. You need to modify this employee class. Similarly, if the database structure changes or the report format changes, this class would need to be touched as well. By splitting the responsibilities, now we have created four classes. So the employee class focuses solely on holding employee data. Pay calculator handles the calculation of employee pay. The employee repository is responsible for saving employee data to the database. And the employee report generator is solely responsible for generating reports based on employee data. And hence, the code becomes much easier to understand as each class has a clear and focused purpose. And if the logic for calculating pay changes, you only need to modify the pay calculator class. Changes to the database persistence or the report generation won't affect the employee or pay calculator classes. And hence, it also becomes simpler to write unit tests for each class as each class has single responsibility and can be tested in isolation. And finally, the pay calculator, employee repository, and employee report generator classes can potentially be reused for different types of employees or in other parts of your application. The single responsibility principle promotes modularity and separation of concerns. By breaking down a complex class into smaller focus classes, you make your code more maintainable, testable, and adaptable to changes. And this leads to a more robust and sustainable software design. In open close principle, the idea is the software entities such as classes, modules, functions, etc. should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Let's elaborate an open close principle example focusing on pay calculator and employee types. In this example, the pay calculator class is not open for extension. Every time you introduce a new type of employee, for example, a salesperson or intern, you need to modify the calculate pay method. This violates the OCP because the class is not closed for modification. Such changes introduce the risk of breaking existing functionality and make the code less maintainable. So in the improved design here, we introduced an employee interface that defines a calculate pay method. Each employee type, be it manager or engineer, implements this interface and provides its own specific implementation for calculating pay. The pay calculator class remains unchanged. It now simply delegates the calculation to the employee object itself through the calculate pay method. And hence, you can easily add new employee types by creating new classes that implement the employee interface. There is no need to modify the existing pay calculator class. At the same time, it is closed for modification. The core logic of the pay calculator remains untouched, reducing the risk of introducing errors when adding new features. The design is also more flexible and adaptable to changes in pay calculation logic for different employee types. You can modify the implementation within each specific employee class without affecting others. 
and which is why this code base becomes much more organized as each employee type's pay calculation logic is encapsulated within its own class. List of Substitution Principle or LSP. Here the idea is the objects of a superclass should be replaceable with the objects of its subclasses without affecting the correctness of the program. Let's try to deep dive into this. In this scenario here, the employee class establishes a contract that includes both paying salary and paying a bonus. However, the contract employee subclass breaks this contract by overriding pay bonus to throw an exception. The problem arises when you use a contract employee where an employee is expected, as in this example below. This violates LSP because the contract employee cannot be substituted for an employee without causing unexpected behavior, for example the exception in this case. The code that works with the general employee should also work seamlessly with any of its subtypes. There are few ways to address this issue. Contract employee doesn't need to implement pay bonus anymore. By separating the interfaces here, we have clearly defined which types of employees are eligible for which type of bonuses. Or you can make the optional bonus logic itself. For example, you can also have the pay bonus method still present in contract employee, but it doesn't do anything harmful. Or it could just log a message indicating the contract employee isn't eligible for any bonus. You could also move the bonus payment logic to a separate class, say bonus processor. This way, the employee classes themselves don't need to worry about bonus logic. So why this is better? It's better because the code behaves consistently regardless of whether it is dealing with a regular employee or a contract employee. There are no unexpected exceptions. The code is easier to understand and modify because the responsibilities are clearly separated. You can easily add new employees types without having to change existing code as long as they adhere to the interface contracts. The list of substitution principle or LSP helps ensure that your class hierarchy is well designed and that your code behaves predictably even when you use polymorphism such as substituting a subclass for a superclass and this leads to more reliable and maintainable software. Interface segregation principle or ISP. The idea here is many client specific interfaces are better than one general purpose interface. So in this example here, we have a single interface called employee actions that defines a broad set of actions an employee might perform. The issue here is that not all employees need to perform all these actions. For example, a manager might need to attend meetings but not submit timesheets, while a contract worker might only need to work and not require to attend meetings or submit timesheets. If we force all employee types to implement this interface, we end up with unnecessary method implementations that don't apply to certain roles. For example, here the manager class is forced to provide an empty or exception throwing implementation of submit timesheet because it doesn't apply to their role. And the solution here is that we have three separate interfaces, each focusing on specific responsibility. So we define a worker that has the ability to work. Meeting attendee defines the ability to attend meetings and timesheet submitter defines the ability to submit timesheets. Now we can implement only the relevant interfaces for each employee type here. This technique is better because now each employee class can implement only the interfaces that are relevant to its role. Classes are no longer dependent on methods they don't need, making them less tightly coupled. And each interface is more focused and easier to understand. Changes to one interface are less likely to affect classes that don't implement that interface. The interface segregation principle encourages you to break down large interfaces into smaller, more specific ones. And this allows clients or classes to depend only on the methods they need, promoting cleaner, more maintainable and less coupled code. And finally, dependency inversion principle or DIP. The idea here is the high level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstractions or interfaces. Let's take a closer look. So in this example here, the employee class directly depends on a specific low-level module, the email sender class, and this creates few problems. The employee class is tightly coupled to email sender class here. If you want to change the way notifications are sent, for example, using an SMS instead of email, you would need to modify the employee class itself. This makes the code less flexible and harder to maintain. The employee class can only be used in conjunction with email sender class. If you want to use different notification mechanism, you would have to create a new employee class or duplicate the notification logic. And finally, testing the employee class becomes more difficult because it is tightly coupled to an external dependency such as email sender. You might need to mock or stop the email sender 
to isolate the behavior you want to test. Now, in this improved design here, we have introduced an abstraction, the notifier interface, which defines a contract for sending notifications. Both the email sender and the SMS sender classes implement this interface adhering to the contract. The employee class now depends on the notifier interface, not on a specific implementation. So, the employee class is no longer tied to a specific implementation. It depends on the notifier abstraction, making it much easier to swap out notification mechanisms without changing the employee class. The employee class can now work with any class that implements notifier interface, promoting code reusability. You can easily test the employee class by providing a mock notifier implementation, focusing on the core logic of the class without dealing with external dependencies. As we have seen, solid principles are not just theoretical concepts. They are practical tools that empower us to build software. Remember, Solid principles are not just rigid rules, but guiding principles. There might be situations where a trade-off is necessary, but having a solid understanding of these principles will undoubtedly elevate your software design skills. So the next time you embark on a coding project, keep solid principles in mind.